we welcome you to another edition of Being Well Informed. My name is Claudia Barber, and I am the host of this uh, program, podcast, and television program. And we are happy to have as our very fine guests on this uh, wonderful uh, afternoon, um, the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition. Dr. Marsha Coleman, welcome. Dr. Julia, welcome. Dr. Karen, welcome. How are you all today? Fine, thank you. you. Good, good, good. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I want to get started right away and really dig into this issue of why the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition exists and why are we discussing this topic of the, the possible desecration of the slave cemetery? Uh, tell us about yourself, Dr. Marsha, first. We'll start with you and the organization. Uh, thank you. I'm the president of Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition, and I'm also the first lady of Macedonia Baptist Church. Um, tell me about yourself. I'm from Detroit, Michigan, originally. I'm a Detroiter, and um, I've been engaged in in activism, I suppose, my entire life. Um, And I worked for 18 years at the Environmental Protection Agency, um, where we we worked very hard to create a place where people could tell the truth when they saw um, fraud or waste, and we were able to get a law passed to um, to to uh, to move that process forward called no fear, um, and after that, um, you know, I began to work with my husband at the church, and and that's and around the same time he becomes pastor, and that's when we found out about a cemetery of of very brave African warriors um, who were um, what year is this across the street from our church. Um, that's at about 2016, 2017. Okay. And so and how we, did this, yes, how did the coalition start? Uh, the coalition started essentially for the same reason that a lot of coalitions started, and that is the government was lying to the people. Um, when we found out, we found out quite by accident that the cemetery across the street from Macedonia Baptist Church um, uh, existed. Uh, I was at a meeting at the planning board, and to be very honest with you, I wasn't familiar at all with local politics. I'm I'm an international development uh, specialist, and but my church has sent me there to uh, because the, the planning board had decided they needed the community to sign off on a, a sector plan that involved our church, and. And, and so there was, and they started talking about the fact that the land across the street from our church, that, that there was some misconception, there was a myth um, that there was an alleged cemetery across the street from our church. Now this is Bethesda, Maryland. This Correct. is Bethesda, Maryland in 2016, 2017. Wow. And, and they said, there's no, there's no truth to this at all. So don't worry yeah, about it. They, they who said, who said there's no the, truth to this? Well, the person, her name is Gwen Wright. She was director of the um, of the planning part of the um, Maryland Regional Parks and Planning Commission. And so she was trying to reassure us that there was no myth that what they needed from us that day was just to sign off on this sector plan and, and that they would take care of everything else. And there was a man that was sitting next to me who I didn't know very well named Harvey Matthews. And he raised his hand and said, you know, Miss Wright, it's it's not true that, that the cemetery is a myth. Um, that in fact, I used to play in that cemetery as a child. And I looked around the room and I could tell by the way everyone was looking at each other, the, the bureaucrats were looking at each other, that they knew that they had been caught in a lie. And so then I said, you know, if that's a cemetery, where are the bodies? And they said, oh, I don't think we know where the bodies are located. And I said, but those bodies are members of my church. 
I want to know where those bodies are. And, and so she said, well, don't worry about it. You know, we'll take care of it. Very condescending. And I said, look, you know, we're looking at a crime scene here. And I want to know what happened to, and that's how it starts. It starts with a lie, basically, that government officials, um, through their arrogance, um, because they were, um, tr because they traditionally treated black communities in a certain way, felt that they could just steamroll us. Quite frankly, they they could bring us in, have us sign off on on a sector plan, and then then they could sort of go about their business. Uh, creating wealth for, for the developer class. And at that point, we realized within a couple of weeks that in fact, Montgomery County was deeply involved in a cover-up. They were involved in a cover-up of, of, of land around the cemetery. But then we found out that it was more than just a cemetery. That in fact, the reason why our church was located in the place it is now is because there was a thriving black community in that area that had, and and that the members of this community, including Mr. Matthews, that their land had been stolen from them. By yeah, the, the exact location you're referring to where your church is, is what address? It's uh, 1832 River Road. Okay. Uh, a lot of people know it. Be, know this area because there is, first of all, is downtown Bethesda. Oh. It is a downtown Bethesda, but also it's one of the largest Whole Foods stores are located in this area. And people from all over the area come to this Whole Foods. But what's important even about the Whole Foods issue is that the, is that the place where the Whole Foods store is located is the place where is the site where Harvey Matthews family home was located. Mm. And his land had been stolen um, by Montgomery County in collusion with the KKK and developers. So every inch of land in this area was stolen from the Black community. Well, when you say stolen, a lot of people, when it comes to real estate transactions, they often relate to deeds or, or you know, identify with deeds being mm -hmm. recorded. Right. So how does that fit into the picture? Well, I think, you know, you know, I'm talking about post-emancipation now okay. um, because it's important for your viewers to understand that before this independent Black community um, uh, sort of moved and started buying a property. I mean, there was this one woman named Charlotte Gray mm -hmm. and she bought so much property in this area after emancipation that they actually call this area of Bethesda Grayland, um, just out of respect for, for just her accomplishment as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. But before this land was bought by Africans, um, there were four major, what we call death camps in this area that European historians like to call plantations. Uh, they call these areas plantations because for them, the most important activity going on in that space was what people were growing, whether it was tobacco or cotton. That was the essential uh, economic activity for them that made them uh, name that area a plantation. But for those of us in the Bethesda African Cemetery Coalition, we don't think the most important activity that was going on was that plants were being grown. We think the most important activity that was going on is that there was mass murder going on, mm -hmm. that our children and our, foref our forefathers and our foremothers were being murdered in that space, and they were being raped in that space, and their lives were being stolen from them in that space. And so we call that space what every other ethnic group in the world calls it when people are being killed at that rate, and that is a death camp. Um, and so there are four death camps on, on in, and some smaller ones in this area. And after Eman, so and so, so there's this one, this is one area right across, almost across the street from Whole Foods that is basically swampland or what we call in the environmental sciences, wetlands. And because it was agriculturally unproductive, this is the space that all four of these death camps used um, to, um, to, to um, discard or to dump or to, you know, to 
to basically to dump African children um, in in this area. And that's the area that's almost directly across from Whole Foods. And we call that area Old Moses. And we think that there were hundreds, maybe thousands of Africans who were dumped in, who were who are part of this mass grave. And it may in fact be one of the largest mass graves in the United States. Wow. Oh my goodness. Now you also gave us a video mm -hmm. and um, I just wanted to uh, share that. What is this video by the way? Um, this is a video of the, what we call old Moses. This is where uh, the first generation of Africans who were kidnapped um, trafficked to River Road were, were, were buried. And Montgomery County, in order to cover their tracks, in order to erase criminal evidence, um, they decided to remove all the remains, all the evidence from this area and take it to a landfill where Let's the- take a look. Well, okay. So I'm here at Moses African Cemetery and um, Today, the um, county is allowing uh, trucks to come in and continue to desecrate uh, an ancient African burial ground. And I just want to give the public an opportunity to see what's going on here at Moses African Cemetery. Uh, you can see the cat, uh, the cat truck over here. And also, there's always been problems with water. Uh, this was actually wetlands. This was actually a swamp area and they've always they've had a lot of trouble controlling the water in this area which is the reason why they used it as a burial ground because it was agriculturally unproductive um, and as you can see what they're doing now is basically trying to again control i think the water issues at the end of the cemetery uh, but you can see that the men are down there there are no archaeologists here on site uh, which is a requirement of the county, but Montgomery County doesn't care, of course, because this is an African burial ground. This is where black people were laid. This is where enslaved people were laid to rest, were actually dumped. This was actually a mass, uh, a mass grave. This is what desecration sounds like. This is what desecration looks like. And so we need everyone to come out and support us. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. We're back with the discussion of what we saw and let's fast forward and talk about litigation. We, you know, what led to litigation? 
Well, if you don't mind, I just wanted to give credit to Dr. Wilson, Karen Wilson Ama Achefu, because that was her beautiful voice oh. that you heard in the video. And um, I think she has one of the most moving and soulful and uh, voices that I've ever heard. And I have goosebumps all over my arms right now. <laughs> that is so good and kind. Thank yeah. you. Thank well, you just saw a crime scene, didn't you? That's a crime scene. And, yes. and it only happens to African-Americans and Native Americans um, where the county in collusion with white supremacists and businesses decide that they're going to launder the land and they're going to remove all evidence of black life and all evidence of a community and that they're going to steal the land and basically flip it over uh, to, 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 to white businesses. And that's what you were seeing um, in that video. And I just want everyone to know that one of the, uh, one of the so many unique features of the cemetery is the fact that this is a children's cemetery. Um, and we have just really just come upon this information through our research because Montgomery County had erased almost all the history of this area and we've had to basically knit it back together. But when you look at who was literally on these death camps, um, the average mortality age was about 20 years old. So by the time that an African reached 10 years old, they had lived half of their lifetime. Hmm. And um, and not only that, but after 1807, and Dr. Karen can talk about this a lot more, when when the so-called um, uh, slave trade, what the Europeans like to call slave trade, but we know it was a European human trafficking trade between Europe and Africa and the United States. Um, when that ended, they started another industry in this country, actually shortly before that time, which was sexual violence against little African girls. And, and that was in order for them to breed, what they call breed, um, uh, the next generation of laborers that would go down to, to pick cotton in, in, in the Southern states. And we know that about 60% of those children died in childbirth. So you've just seen the desecration of a, of a children's uh, burial ground. And Montgomery County has fought us every step of the way in terms of bringing this information to light to our community. Reverend Dr. Julianne, can you share more about the, the, the lawsuit that was filed? Absolutely. On August 10th, 2021, Macedonia Baptist Church through its pastor, Reverend Dr. Ola Shagun, Adebayo filed a complaint for a writ of mandamus in the circuit court of Montgomery County, seeking to compel HOC, which is the Affordable Housing Commission, to comply with Maryland Code Business Regulation Section 5505. Essentially, that regulation requires that a court determine whether a piece of land that has been used as a cemetery can remain a cemetery or whether it can be converted to another use. And by stripping the land, desecrating the land, excavating the land and trying to sanitize evidence, they are, and with the help of Montgomery County officials, I might add, some of whom I want to name, but we want to make sure that we preserve all of the issues on appeal. So I won't name them at this time, but there are lots of um, Montgomery County officials who are involved in this travesty. Um, you know, stepping aside from the litigation for just a moment, societies want Americans of every race, every ethnicity to be outraged by the um, desecration of Hebrew or Jewish burial grounds. And we stand in solidarity with indigenous people who have found mass graves in Catholic schools in Canada and Catholic schools in other parts of the world. 
the atrocities committed against any people anywhere is an atrocity against all people. And so it is very important to establish not just a legal precedent, but also a sense of universal outrage regarding the way our people were treated, the way our lives were stripped away, and then even in death, they have found ways to disrespect the sanctity of human life. And so there is, of course, a legal fight that may go on into many years in the future, but there is also a spiritual and a higher law that must be observed in this case. This is happening all, all over the country. And so here in Maryland, I just want to say how proud I am of Reverend Dr. Ola Shegun and Dr. Marsha for their passion and their tenacity. So after the August 2021 case was filed, a um, motion for a temporary restraining order and preliminary injunction was filed in September 2021 regarding parcel 175. And Dr. Marsha, I would ask that you um, stop me and correct me because there, this is a very factually heavy case and I wanna make sure I get it right. So part of the, um, the argument from Macedonia Baptist Church is that the land has been desecrated and that the sale of that land, any sale whatsoever for a use other than a cemetery is illegal. Mm -hmm. And the court was um, exhaustive in documenting the fact that once a piece of land is used as a cemetery, it must always be used as a cemetery because the respect for the dead is paramount. So what happened- Which judge after wrote that opinion? I mean, has is that an order by a judge? Yes, Judge Carla Smith wrote the most brilliant, and I've been a lawyer for a very long time. I don't look old, but I am. So <laughs> she wrote the most brilliant the most passionate, the most well-documented order that I've ever read, and I've read them all. So there are many things that she included in her order, but one thing that she said that I want to just quote directly, that it has been proven as an undisputable legal right to seek a writ of mandamus compelling the HOC to act before selling the Westwood Tower apartments, which means that part of the land that was previously used as a cemetery and which still contains bodies because you really can't extract everything, um, mm -hmm. now has a parking lot over it. It sits under a layer of asphalt and there is also a dog park that mm -hmm. has been constructed on part of what was previously used as a cemetery. And none of these buildings, none of these um, projects went through the proper channels. And so they are illegal. They should be torn down and the land should be returned to the descendants of the people who were buried in that cemetery. Wow. That's huge. That's heavy. <coughs> and so where, what's the status of the litigation right now? So in November, 2021, the commission filed a notice of appeal to the circuit court's interlocutory order, which granted the preliminary injunction. That same day, the circuit court granted the final order providing that it was satisfied that the conditions for issuing a writ of mandamus had been met and that the preliminary injunction would stand. And so once the HOC filed an appeal, then the parties had an opportunity to file briefs and the oral argument will be taking place on October 6, 2022 at 9.30 in the morning. And we are asking everybody to come out and listen to the appeal and also to bear sacred witness personally, spiritually, emotionally. And this is a very, very emotional case. 
it has taken um, a great deal of thought and constraint to be able to get through the um, emotional response to something so egregious. So, so we're so let me yes. Let me say this. You know, um, I hats off to you, Dr. Julianne Robertson, Esquire, because first of all, this is a major undertaking. And litigation of this magnitude is heavy work. It's heavy lifting. And uh, your law firm uh, or you individually should be commended for taking on this type of project because sometimes the other side will just assume you will just go away because people ordinarily cannot afford this type of litigation. Well, so I want to give you. credit. Thank you, and I appreciate that. I want to give credit where credit is due. Um, the law firm of Rothwell Fig has donated its services to okay. proceed forward, and I am coming in as a quasi-spiritual, quasi-legal advisor. Um, I will be transparent that as a minister, I uh, went to an event where people from Benin came to pour libation and do a spiritual ceremony. And um, being able to perceive the movement and the activity of people um, who are in this dimension or otherwise is one of the spiritual gifts I've been given. And so from that moment, I understood that this is a profoundly important issue. And it's happening not just here in Bethesda, which is bad enough in and of itself, but certainly it is happening all over the country. That's terrible. If, if this is happening all over the country, how are they handling, you know, the stopping of, of, of uh, this uh, desecration of uh, enslaved cemeteries? I have a feeling that Dr. Marsha Coleman Adebayo is at the front, the leading edge of this movement to bring the legal and the spiritual and the political issues to the nation. This isn't over and it's not going to be over for a very long time. And so I just have to um, take a moment and call the names of other revolutionaries. We call out Kathleen Cleaver. We call out Asada Shakur. We call out Afeni Shakur. We call out all of the women, all of the mothers who had to stand by and watch their children lose their potential. We had to stand by and watch our daughters lose their virtue in ways that we wouldn't wish on anybody. Our inability to protect our babies from a terrible fate is something that we continue to mourn and we grieve over it, but it's Dr. Marsha who took this up to a higher platform. And I just always uh, mm -hmm. give thanks for women who are courageous and who are not afraid to speak truth to power. Dr. Karen Wilson, what role have you played in, in, in part in this uh, coalition? Well, you know, uh, this is a multifaceted fight. And one of the th things that I most appreciate Dr. Marsha Coleman Adebayo for understanding is that um, our communities as humans and as Africans Africans in diaspora here um, are deeply connected to art and the arts. We are creative people. And this, this has made it possible for us to continue. The creativity is not what we would consider solely cultural, it is also intellectual. Um, and we, so we, we come with a deep understanding of experience, of culture and strength. We, we call that up through the arts. And I have been largely involved 
certainly not on my own. <clears throat> we have wonderful artists in our midst, um, dancers and drummers and uh, <clears throat> fiddlers. Um, we've had all kinds of folks come out and uh, use the arts to protest, to strengthen, to, uh, to tell the truth. And so um, I find, I have found that being on the line has um, inspired me to, to come through with um, three songs. One of them considered the anthem of the Moses fight. And it comes from a chant. And it is, this is the scene of a crime. This is the scene of a crime. This is the scene of a crime, you know. This is the scene of a crime. And that song gives us the opportunity to speak the names Korah Botts, Jeremiah Botts, the Mason family, the Clippers, the Jackson family, way to go Burley. Just the people that we know, whose names we know are buried in Moses. Um, I'd also like to say that my daughter, who passed on in 2016, has been given honorable, um, honorable, an honorable place, an honorary place in Moses. Kevin Zeese, also a great warrior, is honorably and honorarily buried in Moses. I would like to say um, as a historian that we can identify four phases of time um, in Moses. From 1750, circa 1750, somewhere around 1750 to 1807. That is the first phase of African involvement. There's indigenous involvement much earlier of African involvement um, here. And as Dr. Marsha says, we are looking at people who were um, buried uh, a media, at a median age of 20. So below 20, uh, they are being dumped into Moses, often having bled out in childbirth. Um, mm -hmm. And then from 1807 to 1865, that is the period of the, of the of climactic, you might say, sexual violence and what they called breeding of our young women. Um, and from 1865 to 1965, a period where Crow Hill, um, uh, African-American farm families, some 60 families have, had a vibrant, fabulous um, community there, which included three churches, two baseball teams, a bowling alley, and a, uh, a club called the Sugar Bowl. Well, and then, the 19, time, oh, hold on, uh, hold on one more. Dr. Perry, 19, yes. 1965 yes. to the present, where there was displacement and erasure. And that, those are the four areas that we, it is interesting also to note that a number of the people who are most deeply involved in this fight grew up on River Road in one of the most, um, one of the most, in some of the most expensive real estate in the in the country, which means in the world, and never knew that there was a black community there, that a black community had been there, and they are incensed, offended, and outraged and are some of our leaders working with us in this Black-led organization to fight against the desecration and erasure of those that they understand as ancestors. Before we leave, I have to get out again. I want my listeners to be reminded of the upcoming court date. Could you again share that with us? We're going to be in Annapolis in the, appellate, in the Court of Appeals on October 6th. If they want more information, they are certainly free to visit our website, Bethesda African Cemetery, uh, dot net. 
BethesdaAfricanCemeteryCoalition.net and get more information about what we're doing, how they can help us. If they can't come, they can pray. They can pray and they can also send funds. We need to rent a bus. We need to feed the people who are going to be there. We've got a lot going on and we could really use your help. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you.